All right, Mr. Katz. Hi. How are you? Doing great. How are you doing? Good, man. So uh, you grew up in New Hampshire? I grew up in New Bedford and then, oh, moved, and then moved to New Hampshire and then moved back to... Oh, I wasn't sure about whether you grew up... So you did grow up in Mass, but did you go to school in New Hampshire? Uh, both. I was only up there for a little bit because uh, it was the parents' divorce thing, you know? Oh. So I split time between the two and ended up in Boston eventually, so... When you were young and growing up, when did you first start hearing music, and what kind of music were you listening to? The usual. Zeppelin, uh, Aerosmith, Kiss. The classic rock era. Yep, first album, Kiss Alive, you know. Me too. So, well, one of my first. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was, it's, it was all pretty, pretty typical until, uh, until I discovered David Bowie. Oh. And, and that's, I had a neighbor who had a massive record collection, and... Uh, He'd hire me to do odd jobs around his property, <clears throat> and uh, I found a David Bowie record in his collection, and that was it, you know? So this would probably be, what, the, the late 70s, early 80s, late something 70s, like that? Late 70s, yep, definitely late 70s. Wow. Um, it's, it's, it hurts just to say that. <laughs> I, I know, you know, and I know you're a Queen fan, too. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Because uh, we've talked about Queen before. One of my first concerts. Yeah. Did you like uh, John Deacon's bass playing, or were you just a fan of the band? Just a fan of the band. Um, it was more about the, you know, it's more about just Queen being Queen. But uh, was, for bass playing, it was it was Phil in it. It, oh. it was Geezer Butler. Um, and then you know after after I went through my glam phase of uh, T Rex, Gary Glitter, Sweet. That was actually that's one of my first records. Is Sweet Desolation Boulevard. Um, huge influence. ACDC and all those tunes. Yeah, yeah. you know, it, and Fox on Action. Run. Action. Yep. Yeah, so that's a good one. After that, uh, you know, and then it, then it was um, then it was the Ramones. Then it was the Clash and and stuff like that. So you mentioned Phil Lynott in uh, Queen, and I the one of the first shows that I saw was Queen and Thin Lizzy together. Nice. Yeah, I saw Queen three times. So. Did you see him at the Garden? I saw the Garden once, Providence Civic Center, Springfield Civics. Because, you know, I grew up in Mass, yeah, too, yeah, yeah. before I moved to California. Yep. So, you know, as a matter of fact, just going backwards, going forward for a minute, I was driving here this morning, I was thinking, when was the first time I met Tim? And I remembered, and I don't know if you remember, it was at the Foundations Convention in California. Foundations Forum, yeah. Yes, and David Robertson was yep. your manager at the time, Strip Mine, yep. Sake of Strip Mine. Yep. And I saw David, and then he introduced it. I think it was you, and st I think it was all four of you, actually. Right. That was a blast. I mean, that, those were the glory days, you know, um, especially for metalheads. You know, I'd never had any intention of being in a thrash metal band, but um, I knew Stu and Billy and, you know, getting into Seika, and then, you know, all we're gonna we're gonna talk yeah. about sake because I have some <laughs> questions for you about that. So you said you did you start playing bass at a young age or guitar or something? I or? Uh, grew up a Catholic boy, and for <laughs> for uh, confirmation, uh, I got a bass and I saw it in a window and I had no idea if it was a guitar or bass. I just that I want that. And how how old were you? I was twelve. 12 so you so. started pretty young. Yeah, yeah. That's cool. So yeah, that was. But you play guitar too, right? I play it all. What do you got? You got a tuba? I'll get something out of it. Drums? For you. Yeah, I can play drums. Nice. Yeah. So. Nice. But the bass was what got your attention. Yeah, exactly. And then you mentioned some of those bass players that you were listening to. Yeah. Geezer. Now, had you already left New Hampshire at this point to come back to Mass, or are you still up in New Hampshire? I'm up in New Hampshire and, um, you know, playing a couple of garage bands and high school bands and stuff like that. Um, and then my, I was in a band with this guy, Dave Kirkpatrick, and he went to, he's, he graduated, went to Berkeley. Mm -hmm. And so after he left, he was my best friend in high school. So when he left, I was like, what am I doing here? You know, so I hitch, I would hitchhike to Boston and hang out with him on the Hitchhike. Weekends. Yeah, hitchhiking. <laughs> yeah, I don't I remember recommend those. it. I used to hitchhike too. I remember I those I do days. not <laughs> recommend a long-haired, skinny boy in tight jeans wearing girl shirts and eyeliner to hitchhike <laughs> <laughs> at all. You know, I was, I was, I was wow. a glam kid, so. Oh, that's good. Yeah, you're still kind of glammy. You then. saw me on the side of the road. You're, you know, definitely pulling over. <laughs> so, um, 
<laughs> when was that that you actually moved to Boston? Uh, well, first time when I, I started hanging out with Dave when he was going to Berkeley, and then I ended up uh, just moving here permanently. I lived on Haviland Street, which was right next door to TC's Lounge. Um, oh, wow. And you could live on $5 a day because you could get a sl- two slices of pizza and a Coke for a buck fifty. And uh, yeah. And that's, what that's what year would you say that was? That was 84. Oh, you were here that long ago? Yes. Wow. Because I remember uh, <laughs> my graduating class is 83. And our motto was we're young, we're wild, we're free, we're the class of 83. <laughs> Stealing it right from the uh, <laughs> Triumph song there. Um, but yeah. Triumph. Yeah. That was a good band that we don't talk about that much. Oh, I'm yeah. sure that you and I could discuss a lot of obscure, cool bands. I was listening to Fairport Convention last night, and I forgot how good that band was. Well, see, you know, as you get older, I, so I went through a, a recent phase of listening to 70s English folk rock, you know? <laughs> so that's where we are. Here's, here we are. <laughs> yeah, you know, the record I have was this live record from 74, and, and Richard and Linda Thompson weren't even on it. Sandy Denny was Sandy singing Denny, on it. Yeah. And I was like, wow, I thought I bought a record. Where I didn't look at the. There was no listing of who was on it in the yeah. back. I had to go home and look it up. And then I saw, oh, Richard Thompson was already gone, and I didn't have my... But the record was great. Well, and Richard and Linda put out uh, I Want to See the Bright Lights Tonight and yeah, so many yeah. great records like that. Absolutely. I like that song that Richard Thompson has about the 52 Vincent. Yeah. That's a killer song. It's a great song. Yeah. I love it. One of the great all Americana Americana songs. So when you moved to Boston, like I know Seika, but were you in bands before Seika? Yeah, I, I, I bumped around a couple bands and then I was in a band with Bob Daly, who went on to play drums in Chloe, um, and Dave Kirkpatrick from, from high school. We were in a band called Cluster. And Dave was running a studio under the Grecian Yearning in Alston called The Lanes. Um, and we made our records there, our demos there. This is in the days of, like, busting out cassettes. Right, So right. Al- Alston Cassette was right next door to The Lanes studio. So we would record and then have 100 cassettes made and hand them out. Um, at the same time, I was friends with Stu, Stu Schopes. Yeah. Uh, he was working store 24 and he asked me if I wanted to play in Seika. So that's, uh, that's when I joined w- Seika. What's the time uh, on that? Uh, 85, six, seven. Yeah. Probably around 86, wow. 87. So Seika. I've heard so many different stories. I, I can't wait to hear your version what's, of what's it. What's the story you want to hear? Well, I want to know about what happened with the porn star's sake. I want to know about Tang, and I want to know about the name change mostly. So, uh, And Jane was your manager? Jane Gulick, the fabulous, wonderful Jane Yeah, Gulick. who's also in the film industry, which you were in for yes, a long time yep, as well. she still is. Yeah. She's out in L.A. So how did the band come together was it that 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 lineup? TC was the uh, your TC TJ, yes, was the drummer originally. Yep, Tim, Tim Jordan, Jordan yep. right? So they already had <clears throat> the the nucleus of the band. Um, Stu had played guitar on a cluster track, and so we had already been in the studio together, and um, so they got rid of their bass player because he because <laughs> he was married. <laughs> <laughs> So they were like, oh, he can't commit. So um, so they, I came in. So it was me, Tim Jordan, Stu Schultz, Billy O'Malley. And um, he, they already, ha- already had the name Seika. Um, we obviously played a bunch of gigs, had a, lot of, had a good following, played a bunch of parties and stuff. That so was, they were kind of established when you already joined? Just getting established. Okay. Just getting established. But, you know, it didn't take long for, um, especially with Jane's help. To uh, to get things really rolling, and you know, back in the day when there were loft parties where there'd be two hundred people and you know thirty kegs of beer and playing at three in the morning, uh, places like the Res, you know, and stuff like this that. This is like late eighties. We're talking late eighties, yeah. yeah. And uh, eventually played the Rumble and won the Rumble. Won the Rumble. Yep. Do you remember who you beat in the finals? Uncle Betty. Uncle Betty. Yep. Uncle they were Betty. around for a while. They were great. Yeah. And I'm not forget, so in the finals, Uncle Betty, uh, it was at the Paradise. Um, Uncle Betty opens with 
Rock in the Paradise by Styx, and, which was great. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, Matt, the singer uh, for Uncle Betty, uh, Iggy Pop was the MC that year. Wow. And I remember Matt saying, uh, talking to Iggy Pop, hey, Mr. Pop. Thanks, Mr. Mr. Pop. Pop. You know, and yeah. So, but that was that was kind of like the thing that kicked it off because uh, Howie Klein from oh, Zaya yeah, Records yeah. was one of the yeah, yeah. He was one of the judges and uh, offered us a record deal on on Warner Brothers. Really, right there on the spot. Uh, so were you already on Tang at this point? Well, <laughs> we had recorded uh, a record for Tang uh, with Ross Humphreys. Love Shim. Love Shim. Yeah, with Ross Humphreys. God rest his soul. Um, and when we won the Rumble, Curtis decided to hang on to the record. Like instead of releasing the record to capitalize on the Rumble uh, situation, he held on to it. Um, and we spent the following year negotiating with Tang to go to Warner Brothers. So he never released the record for he a did, year? He did release it, but it was a year after the, the Rumble. Oh, win. man. Yeah, I didn't know that. Well, I probably knew that, but I can't remember everything. Yeah, it was it was he held us up. Um, so you had an offer. Did you sign while he already owned? Did he own the master? He owned the master to to the first record, and if if I'm recalling this correctly, wanted a million dollars from Warner Brothers to let us out. Sounds of the like Curtis. And eventually. Uh, it was negotiated down to taking money out of our recording budgets for Warner Brothers. Oh, really? And he walked away with six figures. Wow. A healthy six figures. Oh, then that, that was just the beginning of, well, I won't say, I guess we our could call them problems. Yeah, because <laughs> uh, you guys decided that when you formed the band or whoever did, Stu or whatever, that you wanted to call yourself Seika, and there was a famous porn star named Seika. Correct. I guess she didn't appreciate the fact that you guys were using her name. So the way that, <laughs> the way that happened was uh, <laughs> Stu decided that, he decided on the name, and it was uh, largely believed that she was out of the business, kind of maybe dead. Uh, you know, it's she's an obscure porn star. She was big in porn, but it was porn in the 70s. Nobody, nobody yeah, they didn't go mainstream back yeah. then. And um, so we found out she was still alive when we tried to sign to Warner Brothers and also found out that she had put out uh, – so her, her manager was her husband was her lawyer. Oh, right. And oh, and we said, well, she's not a recording artist. No one's going to confuse it. Well, she is. She put out a record. She uh, did? Yeah, it was a flexi disc in Hustler. Oh, and wow. and it was her like talking dirty over some like porn music. Okay, she's a recording artist. Oh, and she has a line of merchandise. Oh, and you know, so it, he had all the bases covered. Um, so we tried to negotiate with her look, we'll pay you this amount. You can be in our first video and all this. And they wanted an astronomical amount of money. Um, so A lot of people wanted your money back then, Tim. <laughs> well, that's the, re that's the record business. You know, they smell a little money and they all come running. So uh, basically, we had to change the name. And um, so did you ever have to give her any money no. or did Tang have to give her nope. any money? So he was able to put that record out with... The name Seika with Correct. no problem. I have that on vinyl at home, yeah. actually. Um, how did you come up with the name Strip Mind? It's a terrible name. Um, it was not. You said it. I did it. <laughs> it was like <laughs> we were in the uh, Pyr Pyramid Studios in Ithaca, New York with Alex Perialis. Oh, I love Alex. He was, Great uh, he was doing our record. Um, and we had argued about names for a very long time. And the record label called up and said, what do you got? Today's the day, and that's what that's what stuck. Um, I thought I wasn't a fan of it, but uh, it, it it was it was somebody's idea who had more say than the rest. So you you ended up, and we're going to talk about this being more of a spokesman, a leader in other bands in years to come. But back then, you were I was a, just a bass player. Yeah, yeah, that's it, what I thought. It wasn't my band. I I, I so. <laughs> I had written songs for the band, and they were just like, no. 
You're not one of the songwriters. So Okay, so let's talk about those guys. There's Billy O'Malley. Billy and Stu. Stu and Tim Jordan left and then someone else pretty Sully. famous joined the yep, band. Sully, Sully who's now the singer of Godsmack. Right. What was Sully like back then when you guys were playing? Did you see his future? <laughs> well, uh, a lot of people like to talk shit about Sully. But, you know, I don't like his music. But I do 100% back his work ethic. Um, when Tim left, he left in the middle of recording uh, at Pyramid. The band had already become... St oh, he did in the yeah, middle of the what, recording? What had, what had happened was is that... The year we had between negotiating with Tang and Warner Brothers kind of set us back a year and a half recording for Warner Brothers. And in that time, um, people kind of went to their own corners a little bit. And so when we got back to record the record, we, you know, things had changed. And um, we got in the studio, and uh, Tim had had some drums delivered there, his new drum kit. Okay. And it was double kick it was his big kit and he was having problems playing the kit so he had brought his old you know this so two days go by in the studio of, of cutting basics and he was clearly struggling um and so we went back to his old kit but by now he'd been mentally beat up for a couple of days so we took a break and in that break um the decision was made that he wasn't going to come back because we'd spent five days in the studio trying to get drum tracks, and we didn't get a single one. Ouch. Uh, yeah, and it was it was mental exhaustion, you know. Um, I don't know what was going on with him mentally, but he just wasn't wasn't prepared. Um, so when we got Sully, he killed the audition. We get in the studio. He did all of his drum tracks in one day. Did you have to like put the whole recording yep. on hold? All, oh, put it all man. on hold for like two months. Who was your A and R guy at Warner's? Uh, Linnea Nan. Linnea Nan. Yeah, and she was great. At this point, was David Robertson your manager? He was our manager. Yeah. So it, in a short amount of time, we had uh, been beat up by Tang. Um, uh, Dave Robertson came around and says he, he had experience because he used to be on the managing team for Aerosmith. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. So, he was uh, Stephen Tyler's right-hand man. Yeah, yeah. so it, it, there was a, a shuffle in, in that as well because – Certain people in the band thought that we had to step up. Um, you know, I was more of a homebody. I was like, let's stick with Jane. Let's let's record at New Alliance, close to home. That's but, right. I didn't ask you. So did they? They didn't fire Jane, did they? Yes. Or yeah. I said they, but you were part of the they too. Yeah, but, but I was just the not, not trying not to, to put defend this myself. On you. But I was just <laughs> the bass player. I wasn't one of the main guys. And uh, so she was. She was let go, which was terrible. Um, the decision was made to. There was this this band called Wrathchild. Yeah, um, Baltimore band, right? Yeah, yeah. and um, their records sounded phenomenal, which is why we went to Alex in Ithaca. Right. But there was also a conversation that was being had, like, why don't we just stay close to home and put the money? Let's use uh, Mudrock at New Alliance, and we didn't. So, you know, the record comes out. It didn't sound great of all the problems we had been having in the studio. But I will say that Sully came in as the second drummer. He did all of his takes in one take in one day, the entire record. Wow. He nailed it. So I got to gotta hand it to him on that. And as a matter of fact, he uh, ended up using Mud Rock at New Alliance <laughs> to record the Godsmack record. And right? sell like a million copies, right? Yeah. <laughs> And so uh, another weird little tie-in with this is that uh, we were staying at the house next door to Pyramid Studio and Ithaca, Ithaca? In Ithaca New yeah. York, up, upstate. Um, and previous bands had left their VHS collection there. One of those tapes uh, was called the Norma Kuzman Collection, which was basically... Um, and because we were named after a porn star, a lot of people would approach us with tapes vhs tapes that show right. shit like we were porn nuts or something you know <laughs> and uh so this one tape came across the desk the norma kuzman collection and it was all tracy lord stuff before she turned 18 right so That's she had made all these bucks. she had made all these movies and then got sued yeah and, you know all, all i that remember happened. 
but somebody had made like a greatest hits. Essentially, it's por- child porn if you look at it from a legal standpoint. You're right. But um, so this tape was floating <clears throat> around. Sully had a copy of it, and he had made friends with a DJ at WAAF who had an affinity for porn and presented this tape to him. And they became buddies. Like, all of a sudden, they were like buddies. This is a story I never heard. (laughs) So Sully's like, hey, here's a demo of my band, Godsmack. You should check it out. And then so this DJ on AAF starts playing Godsmack. And the next thing you know. But also, another Sully story that people don't really realize is that... um, Couple couple thick connections to his loyalty. So all the guys that we had on the road crew for for Seika, uh, he took with him to Godsmack. He and did. He did. And when he um, when he was being courted by record labels because of the popularity of uh, his song on WAAF, he got a, sh- a show at CBGB's in New York. And what they did, what he did, is he rented two buses and put kegs on the buses and sold tickets to his friends in in uh you know Lowell and Lynn and Lawrence. Yeah, he's from up that area. Yeah. yeah. And uh, Haverhill. S- hey, like, co- yeah. come see us in at CBGB. He's a legendary scene. Wow. He sold 200 tickets to the party bus. The bus drives down. They pack CBGBs. Wow. And so the move. label people come in and go like what are all these what's going on here? This place is packed. Was this late prospective labels, or was did he have a deal already? This is when people were trying to sign Godsmack. So he did the work. He certainly and he did. Got, and and that, that piqued the interest in Godsmack. And not to keep going on about Sully, but even afterwards, they said, hey, we're going to give you a million dollars to shoot a video. He goes, nope, I'm going to shoot it with my own company. And they shot it at one of those AAF outdoor things. Do you, do you think this is a learning experience from being around strip mine that he came up with all this stuff on his own? Or I think he's a smart, hardworking individual, and he made it work. And he also, like, he didn't sign a deal, a typical deal. Like, he saw that the deal that strip mine had got that he and he's doing the math. He's like, we're gonna have to pay back a half a million dollars. So what he what does he do? He licenses the Godsmack record. He doesn't sign a record deal. He licenses the record. And what he does is wow. when they say, we want to make a video, he goes, I already made a video, and I'll sell it. To, uh, you know, it, it's here. You put it out. I've already paid for it. So he has his buddies shoot uh, a live show at a WAF um, outdoor concert. And when it comes time to make Godsmack shirts, typically it's like, oh, we got this big merchandising company. They're going to give you 50% of all the earnings, and they'll control all of it. The, they'll take care of the merchandise. Right. Goes, no. I have my own merchandising company, and I'm going to make my own shirts, and I'm going to hire my guys. So he's very loyal, very smart. He's very smart. And <laughs> and I never heard any of this yep. before. Well, th- you know, it's it's easy to shit on him because his music's so terrible, but you got to hand it to the guy. Like even even when we were recording this, <laughs> even when he joined Seika Strip Mine, yeah. we were doing thrash metal, right? And he goes, guys. We should be doing this and pointing to like Alice in Chains and stuff like that. That's exactly what he became. Right? And 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 <laughs> and, and, this, and Stu was just like, no, we got signed doing thrash metal. We're doing we're doing us. And he's like, dude, this, but but this is where it's going. And they were like, no. And so he had the smarts, wow. you know, and and he created this opportunity for himself. Yeah, I I'm not a Godsmack fan either, and I. I Heard that the guys did. I'm, I'm not saying you, but I heard that certain guys didn't treat him very well when he was in the band. You know. Well, I mean, he was. He could be difficult. Let's put. It, he's the only person in a band that I've gotten in a fist fight with. Oh, a fist I've never, fight! I've been in a lot of bands, but he's the only. He's guy probably. I've, he's not that tall either, right? No, he's not. So you guys are almost the same. Not. I'm, Come on. I'm, I'm not saying you're short. <laughs> well, you know, I'm five eight, and I think no, I, he, he was probably like five four. Yeah, but he's a. I mean, he's a strong dude. He was back in the day. Um, Are you saying you lost a fight? Well, it didn't really turn into much of a fight because we were in the van going 90 miles an hour down. Oh, the those are the best kind of van fights, man. Those are the best kind. No, he can be difficult, but I got to hand it to him. And, and you know what? His loyalty even goes so far as to, so we we hired Alex Perialis to record the record who had done the Wrathchild record. So 
we also toured with a band called Lillian Axe. Oh, yeah. I so think, d didn't David manage them, too? Yes, he did. Yeah. So Tommy, who played drums for Louisiana, Lillian Axe. right? Yep. We, yeah. He ended up playing for Godsmack. Oh. Because we had met them on the road. We were on tour with them. And then when Tommy left, he called up Shannon Larkin from Wrathchild to play drums for Godsmack. So Sully he, resourcefulness. Very resourceful. Sounds like that's that's his whole deal. Yep. Wow. Okay, let's just put a bow on the strip mine thing Done. for a second. <laughs> um, how, what, what happened? To who? To strip mine. Uh, it was done. One rec, one and done. Sully quit. Oh, he quit the band. He quit, fired, depending on who you talk to. Uh, and that was it. And then you lost David, and that was the end of it. We lost Billy. Billy, Billy O'Malley, lost. who was basically the, the heart and the soul. Yeah, and he had that real star quality going on about him. Yep. You guys look good, but Billy, no shirt on usually. Like, I, I always like to, and this is true of, of even Road Song later when we were on tour, being on stage and looking out at the audience. So the singer in the middle has the, the wild guys. They're like, yeah, yelling and pumping their fist. Um, Billy had all the girls in front of him. Going, Billy. Uh, I believe that. <laughs> Me, I had the weirdos. I had the, I had the guy with one leg, and you know the the, you know just just the the castaways on my side. So, yep. Wow. Well, um, okay, we got to talk about a band that you were in for a lot longer than that. That band, Roadsaw, was next, right? Yeah. Was there anything in between mm -hmm. Strip Mine and Roadsaw? I, I, I had done uh, Black Salad. Which was oh, a yeah. Sabbath tribute band. Yes. And, but other than that, no. I went straight from. Uh, I started doing Roadsaw right when uh, Seika stopped. Was the original uh, lineup you, Craig Riggs, what was uh, with Steve Malone? Steve Malone. Yep. Uh, and that's it? Was at, it a three at, piece at originally? First, at, at first. And then um, we were drinking at Father's um, outside of Kenmore Square. And Daryl Shepard was there and he goes, I want to be in your band. And we we're like, okay. So this is before <laughs> you recorded anything. Yeah, yeah. So did you know Craig? Because you and Craig have been like to working together I know, for I a long Craig time. I knew Craig from uh, the Res. Uh, him and Todd had a, a space on Albany Street, at the end of Thayer Street, called the Res, which was a party. You know, through massive parties. Um, I had also uh, knew him just just from around his band Joe. We'd played with Joe a bunch of times, um, so I knew him. Just from around, you know. Um, just a, the road saw thing. Six studio albums, probably. And there were a <laughs> bunch of singles and EP compilations. Uh, Fancy Pants, your yep. tune. Was that the first single? That was the first single. Yeah, I love that one, man. That was a good one. I like a lot of the road saw stuff. I mean, I've always thought road saw was one of the best bands. I wanted to ask you about how you guys were able to endure the lineup changes over the years because it was quite a few lineup changes yeah right? i mean um we were together so long it's i mean you and craig are the two consistent correct. members. yep um you know it, it it always seemed to get better with the lineup changes so that was kind of the one of the things that we kind of stuck to me and craig was like it, it's we're gonna if we're gonna switch people out it's got to get better to me the best lineup was um, Ian Ross on guitar, Hari Hassan on drums. Yeah, Hari. And he was, yeah, phenomenal drummer. Um, so that was the, the rock and roll uh, record came out of that lineup, and it's, I think it's our best. Yeah, I liked what Ian brought to the band. No offense against Daryl and no, Steve, because I love those Darryl guys. Daryl and, and, and Ian were in the band for, together for a while. Um, so, yeah, it was, it was pretty good. Not to change the subject, but I have to. I'm very interested to see how Daryl and Steve Rustine work together in their new band that they have, yes. The Long Wait. Yeah. Because I like, Dar you know, Dar I've seen so, and you have too, because I know you were there at some of his worst moments because we were there. Correct. We, but Daryl and I are friends, so we've talked about this stuff before, so he's not going to take it personally. But his, he's always been like a guitar player that I've admired for his big, heavy sound, you know? And him and Ian complimented each other quite yeah. well. I saw that version of the band yep. several times. Daryl's, Daryl's a, he's an amazing guitar player, and he's one of those guys that, the minute you hear a lead, you're like, that's Daryl. You know, he's got, yeah. he could be playing through a $200 guitar 
and a transistor radio, and you would still know that it was him playing. He's got a signature sound. I don't know. It's all in the fingers, but uh, great guitar player. And him and him and Greg do kind together. Yes, they do. Yep. Which um, is also they're great. Yeah, I know. I like them a lot. They're yeah. they're the great stoner rock band. Not totally. that Roadsaw was in a stoner <laughs> rock band. Um, Roadsaw. Uh, you guys did accomplish a lot. I mean, we people did. might not realize it, but you guys, I remember really early before I even got to know you very well, you guys in Tree decided to go on a tour together. Yep. Talk about that. What was that like? So it was tr uh, Tree, Stompbox, and us. Sorry, um, I forgot about Stompbox. Yeah, They're but they were going band. through something at the time, too, because they... Uh, something was... They had been dropped by Sony. And that's the other thing, too. When, when Seika was going... Orangutan had just gotten signed. Stompbox had just gotten signed. The Boss Tones were signed. Power Man 5000. So there was a lot going on yeah. at that time. But um, yeah, that was our first national tour. And it was fantastic. It, we couldn't be on a, on a better tour with better Did guys. you just have two vans and you guys... Three vans. Three vans. Yep, all bands in their own vans and just kind of uh, convoy across. Three, oh, yeah, three bands. Yeah. So i'm trying to think tree was more hardcore you guys are more stoner and 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 stomp box was more like helmety yeah so it wasn't really like three identical bands so it's kind of a cool tour yeah w were you guys able to get people to come to the shows yes and no it depends on the day of the week and it depends on the location um but it was a good learning experience it was at great the time. yeah and and i had the the van from the seca days like nobody in the band wanted to sign on their information onto the registration and stuff. So when the band broke up, I, I'm like, this band's mine, motherfucker. Nice. So <laughs> it was like we had that. Um, and th that tour brought us uh, to San Francisco where I met Frank Kozik and Lydia Russell at Man's Ruin. Oh, yeah. and You uh, ended up having records on yep, Man's Ruin. Yep. And so Frank put out the, the, um, the single for us for Not Today. Uh, how many different labels is, was Roadsar on? I mean, I know about Curve and Man's like, Ruin. You're in a Detroit label too, right? Small Stone. Small Stone. Probably like 84 different labels. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> we had a, we had deals in Europe um, with other record labels. We put out split singles with people. We anybody that asked us to do anything, we just we did it. So uh, we were very fortunate because Craig had a recording studio. Right, so, Mad Oak, right? Yeah. So we, if which is still going strong. Yep, absolutely. So we were able to, um, if somebody's like, "Hey, we're putting out a compilation record. You want to throw something on there?" Yeah, sure. You know, so we would go in, write a song, and put it out there. Now, Road Saw is still together, basically. You just on a little hiatus. Or? Well, we never broke up, but right. we all kind of went to our separate corners. Um, we're older. Uh, some guys like to drive some don't you know so it's it, it's it's on but hiatus you, but you <laughs> wouldn't we did would you're not saying you've played your last show though no i'm song. just saying that i'm doing other stuff i'm doing white dynamite with well craig's yeah. and white dynamite we're too. gonna get to that yeah and um craig's doing kind uh ian lives up in portland and he plays guitar in a band called Mercilago. um so you know everybody kind of just started doing other stuff uh, the the thing that me and Craig always said was well, some bands love to announce we're breaking up you and know then, what? and then two <laughs> years later they're like doing shows again so it's like yeah I was at the last mission of Burma show in 1983 right. so I know exactly what you mean yeah Motley Crue is still on the road for some reason uh, I can imagine Roads. Well, I'm I'm not I'm not part of the band, so I can yeah. I can only imagine that Roadsaw will play another show someday. I feel like there yeah. will be a Roadsaw show at Th some point. There, there could be. Um, it's it's <laughs> it's one of those things. When the box set comes out. <laughs> well, you know, I recently moved um, from one house to another, and I have so many cassette tapes of so many songs that we've written in a, a haze of pot smoke that um, <laughs> just never saw the light of day. So. I gotta say, I remember going to a lot of good parties in the road, saw our uh, rehearsal space oh, yeah. in the New Alliance building on 1312 Boylston. That's that was right. the place where everyone would show up at like two in the morning, three in oh, the morning. Yeah. <laughs> yep, it, 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 especially it when the Linwood shows were happening, it would be easy to just walk right over there. Absolutely. People were like, Linwood? 
13, 12, what? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was, there was a lot happening. That's when then. we got to know each other, really, through yep. Curve, because you signed uh, Three and a Half Girls, the first Correct. band I managed, the Curve of the Earth. Yep. And that was when Roadsaw was, I think, on maybe their second record or something? Probably working on their second record. Yeah. I was also booking, I started booking O'Brien's. Yeah, I wanted to talk to you about that, because you had a really successful run at O'Brien's. I mean, I remember going there every Thursday night. It yep. would be like, that would be the place to be, man, on Thursdays. It was, Alston, um, when I first moved to Alston, had several Did you clubs. start the O'Brien scene, basically? Yes. Yeah, I thought so. I'm going to take full credit for that. You should, you should, because <laughs> those shows were unbelievable over there. O'Brien's used to be uh, a shitty, light beer, bad cocaine, townie bar um, that had a good location. Had a good location <laughs> and had uh, Sunday nights, they had like a, a deadhead cover band. Um, so I walked in there and was like, can I do shows here? I just want one night a week. So we were doing Thursday nights. And then um, the owner, Frank, was like, hmm, how about you doing Friday and Saturday too? So we ended up doing Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And um, the townie guys didn't like it at all. They they were this is their bar. There was but eventually, it ended up being seven nights a week, and still going strong to this day. Yeah, I remember being at some absolutely epic shows at we had at that some club. phenomenal shows. There was a one particular show uh, called the Kung Fu Barbecue. Yeah, remember that? And yeah. it was like Scissor Fight, Tree, Quintain, Honky was... Ball, Quintain, yeah, yeah. Road Saw. It's just like down the list. Of... Yeah, I remember that show. There's great posters, man. Yeah. Sticky, was that Sticky her name? Sticky did the posters. Sticky used to do like these phenomenal posters. I've got a bunch of them. I save all yep. my posters. We had 200 people in there. Capacity is 50 people. <laughs> and <laughs> cooking meat, have kung fu on the, on the TVs. And uh, the cops came in and busted it up. And that was sort of the end of that. But uh, that was a phenomenal time. You helped me a lot because I had a bunch of different bands at that time. They all played at O'Brien. Yep. So Three and a Half Girls really used to murder good. that place. Yeah, I remember seeing some un unforgettable shows there. Um, that was it for you for booking, though. You didn't book any other clubs, no, I, did you? It's, uh, it, it sucked because I booked the Linwood, and I fucking after that, I didn't want anything to do with booking. Yeah. If so many people just don't like you. Well, <laughs> yeah, you can, and you can't please easy. everybody. So. Right. I, there were, for a time there, I was... Um, I was booking O'Brien's. I was playing in Honey Glazed and Roadsaw, and I was helping out um, Half Cocked. I helped them do their first record. I remember that time and, and, period. And Virago Go, uh, Veragogo. Uh, I helped them with their <laughs> record. Too. So it's like I was doing a lot of stuff. Um, Ross worked with them too. You and Ross were pretty tight, yeah. right? Yep. And, and did you have a lot to do with him working with a lot of these bands? Or he, was he already established when you met him? Or Yeah, and, and Ross was one of those guys who... Ross Humphrey we're talking about, yeah. Had been around a long time, but was blessed genetically. Uh, he, <laughs> it was just a, he always looked young. And it was a good-looking guy, but he was, a lot, he was much older than... Me. Well, I do know, and I'm not going to mention her name, I do know an 18-year-old girl that wrote a song called 52, and it's about Ross Humphrey. No kidding. Yep. She well, was only it, like 18 or 19 at the time. Yeah, so. and he was... Uh, I'm not going to mention her name, but... He, yeah. he was a great engineer. I, we did, this, <laughs> did the Seika record with him. I did the Honey Glaze record with him. I did a, I did a lot of projects with him. Because you mentioned Very Go Go. I know he produced Very Go Go, yep. too. Talk about some of your other bands here before we get to White Dynamite, which is right a really cool band that you're in. Antler, I don't know much about, but you put two records out. Yeah. Uh, after Roadside went on hiatus, I moved to L.A. and um, I remember yeah. that. You see, I wasn't living here either because I moved, but I wasn't in L.A. when you were in L.A. I think I was in Phoenix, Arizona, yeah. but Antler, I missed Antler for some reason. Road, Roadstyle went through a phase where um, we were kind of didn't have a, a label, didn't have a tour. Uh, I ended up moving to New York with my girlfriend, um, came back, moved to L.A. Um, at that time, Mud Rock was out there, Scott Gilman was out there, uh, some of the uh, collage from Honey Glaze was out there. 
Uh, Christine McCarthy. Christine McCarthy was out there. So I had a lot of friends out. Power Man was out there. Um, uh, Half Cocked was out there. You didn't like L.A., though. Uh, I didn't. I didn't. It was it was a weird time in my life. Like, I remember you. T I remember I ran into you one night after that years later when I was working with uh, the Charms. Yeah, we were at a show together, and I uh, you told me you didn't like L.A. then, but maybe you changed your mind. No, I mean it was just I didn't I didn't like it because I wasn't in a good place for it. You know, I ended up going out there with a shoebox full of money and blowing it all. And you could do that in L.A. Yeah, it was <laughs> it was, it was just. Uh, it was easy to blow through that money. Yeah, blow through yeah. that money. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no pun intended. Uh, so Antler, what label was Antler on? Uh, Tortuga, which was Mike right. Thompson's label. Right. So when I came back from L.A., I was like, <clears throat> I, I had written a bunch of songs that were more leaning towards uh, a country rock kind of sound, uh, and it ended up being. You know, the second record ended up being three quarters of Antler. On, I mean, three quarters of Roadsaw. Me, Craig, and Ian, and people would come to the shows. We did pretty, we made some good records, um, but people uh, were like, "Well, how come you guys ain't doing Roadsaw?" <laughs> so we just put that behind us. They don't know what they have till it's gone. Yeah, those people. Uh, were there any other bands? I knew you mentioned Honey Glazed. Um, I know you got some solo stuff. I was going to ask you about that in a yeah. minute, but. Um, was there other bands between that period up until White Dynamite? Jeez. Um, I played in a band called Black House, for a little, which was three bass players <laughs> and a drummer. That sounds nice and noisy. Yeah, with, with Kevin Grant, who's in Wirelines now, um, which, which was a lot of fun. Uh, other than that, I mean, I did one-off stuff. Uh, I, I had a band called Dead Pegasus, which was just gloomy acoustic stuff with Dave Unger. Um, Who you're playing with now. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, what else? Jeez. I did Black Salad. Uh, I, I did a thing with uh, way back when. It was um, me, Jim Genota, Janet Egan, and Justine Kovalt. Um, Jim was going out with Janet. I was going Tim out with Tim and the Unclean? No, it, was, uh, <laughs> it was called Boo. So you play with three members of Justine and the Unclean, yeah. basically. Yep. Wow. And uh, it was it was a cover band called Boo. We did a, a Halloween gig. It was all Sonics covers. and uh, But yeah, it was just stuff like that, you know? Justine Kovalt has Kovalt really in, reinvented herself in an unbelievable way, huh? Unbelievable. Like, um, her and I dated for years back in the day. I was in Seika. She was in Malachite. Yeah, I remember that band. Who, oh, they were absolutely been phenomenal band. The original singer, she vanished yep. or something, right? Yep, Linnea. She, uh, they were scheduled to go, my understanding is they were scheduled to go record with Steve Albini, and she disappeared. Like, they wow. were on the brink of just being huge. And I, I, I think they would have been, you know? The second version with Nancy Fanara, Rest in Peace, and Jane Cobran was not that bad either. Yeah, they were good. I got yeah. demos of both of those bands. Yep, yep. But Somehow that, they ended up in L.A. on my desk, but I never did anything, so fuck you, Steve. You know, you blew that one. The, uh, I love all girl bands, so I don't know what I was thinking. Yeah, <laughs> Ma Malachite, that um, Abracadaver was the name of their, oh, yeah, yeah. The, the first demo, and it had uh, Fuck Me in the Cemetery. Yeah, yeah. And really dark, heavy yeah. shit. It was so good. So um, let, I want a couple other things here, but White Dynamite, that's been going on for a few years now. Yep. It's uh, Dave, Dave Craig, Wonder, Craig, you. John Darga. Really good guitar player. Yep. Yeah. I've known well, the him whole since, band's the, since the Wrecking Crew days. Him and I lived together at 20 Ashford, a uh, famous rock house in Alston, which housed members of Slaughter Shack, Wrecking Crew, Seika. Uh, Cam Ackman lived there for a while from the Prime Movers and Voodoo Dolls. So it was like the the... The, uh, <laughs> it was like the Adams Family House on a block uh, at 20, 20 Ashford Street. I have not seen White Dynamite. I've heard a lot of your stuff. Oh, jo it's amazing. Joni Lindstrom, when, <laughs> when Joni was on my show. Sorry. When Joni, it's okay. You, it. When Joni Lindstrom was on my show, she's, I let her pick the songs that she wanted, and she's like, White Dynamite. I'm nice. Like, okay, we played a White Dynamite song. Uh, Dave, I've known since Random Road Mother, yep. so... Uh, you guys have all you guys have been friends for a long time. Yeah, the, the guys it, in the band. So. Dave played a bunch of keys for Roadstar. He actually came on the road with us a few times, um, and uh, you know, behind the bar at the model for many many yeah. years. He's got a new band called Lipsmack, Lipsmear. 
lip, lip smear. smear. And uh, him and Sean drink water. So, nice. Uh, yeah, they, they, I think their first show is tonight. So. Right. Now, White Dynamite's playing with The Long Wait. Yep. And Keith Bennett's new band, Casket Rats. Oh, yeah. I'll be at that show. That's at Notch, right? Yeah. yeah. Notch has a, they're opening up the garage uh, for, for live bands now. So oh, nice. Good. Yep. Can't wait. I, I love I love going over there. It's going to be a I night. I don't drink anymore, but I love going over there. <laughs> it's going to be a night of 50-year-old punk rock guys who have all played in each other's bands. Yeah. Well, ja seeing Jamie from SSD and yeah. Mark McKay and those guys yep. together is going to be something special. The whole and, uh, thing's going to be good. Glenn Dudley from Wrecking Crew is singing. Uh, right. Yeah. Okay, I, want, I don't want to forget this, but you did a solo record where you had a bunch of different singers on it. Right. And then you have another one? I actually, <laughs> so where, where things are now, um, I did a record called Fly Like a Seagull. Uh, my wife, uh, Jessica, lovely girl, lovely woman. Um, she's a bit younger than me, so she's not a fan of classic rock. Um, so we're driving along one day and turn on the radio and Fly Like an Eagle by Steve Miller <laughs> comes on. And she goes, this is the fucking dumbest song ever. Fly like an eagle to the sea. <laughs> Seagulls fly to the sea. Oh. Right? And I'm like, fly like a seagull, you know? Nice. So, so uh, that record is about <laughs> as dumb as it sounds. Uh, it's about a seagull. It's not, It's not. Uh, what was the um, the book about a seagull? Jonathan Livingston. Oh, yeah, yeah. Jonathan Livingston Seagull. Oh, no, whatever it is. But uh, so it's, it's kind of like that where, you know, seagull's born, seagull dies. But I had written all these songs. Um, I did all the basics with Craig on drums, Craig Riggs. And then I just invited different people to come and sing and play guitar and, and whatever. And it, and it came out great. I was looking for it on Bandcamp, but I couldn't find it. Where can I get that record? Uh, it's called TC and the Seaside Assembly. Is it on Bandcamp? Yes, it is. Why couldn't I find it? I I'll just send it did to a you. Tim Katz search and I couldn't find it. I ended up doing a second one called TC and the Greasy Hearts with Mike Peel. Yeah, I saw drums. you at New Alliance, right. and you guys were Mike Peel. Phenomenal. You always got good drummers, man. <laughs> he is he's amazing, and he's an amazing human as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's too bad about reverse, man, you know, yep. being shame. I mean, he's uh, he's one of the most solid drummers I know, and, and it was a, it was a absolute blast to play with him. And, and also the thing, just for um, perspective, I never send demos to people with this stuff. It's like you show up in the studio and do you learn the song on the spot. Oh, really? Yeah. And because I think it kind of adds a bit of liveliness to the to the process. Doesn't it add to the cost of the studio time, though? <laughs> well, if you're no, it doesn't actually because I work with only professionals. <laughs> okay. So so like Mike can come in, hear something, and boom, done. Who did you have, Alec Rodriguez? Alec Rodriguez, oh, yeah, he's yep. the best man. Yep. I well, I like a lot of engineers in Boston, so I don't mean to just single no, one out. But that Alec, great. I know he just went out with uh, Sharon Van Etten and Angel Olsen. Yeah, he's doing all right. Yeah. Um, one last thing, I, I I only have one of them, Hangover Palaces. I pulled it out last night and read a couple chapters to refresh my memory. You're an author. You what was the first book called? Horseshoes and Hand Grenades. Yeah, those books are st basically story, very Bukowski-ish, which makes me like it because yeah. I love Bukowski. And you wrote those about real stories pretty yeah, much, right? Pretty, pretty much. You know, the, uh, names have been changed to protect the innocent. But, um, yeah, I just threw two boxes of those in the trash. What? <laughs> you did not. I did. I was moving, and I'm like, ah, oh, fuck these, you know? And I just, oh, you know, So now they're, now they're rare and hard to find. Wow, I remember when you were doing that first book because I had a book of poetry and you asked me how I did it and I was like, I don't know. I just went to a print place. Yeah. And they <laughs> I mean, I, I went through a phase where I was trying to be a writer. That's why I went to L.A. Um, and I, I had scared up some writing gigs, but I didn't really realize the, the grind of being um, a journalist. or it, it was really a bit much. Well, you did a good job because I like the stuff you wrote, man. Thanks. Thanks. Um, Thanks a lot, dude, for coming down. Thank you. And one one last thing. Okay. I have a new record coming out in the fall. Uh, my ba new band's called Horseneck. A and new band. <laughs> yeah, it's called Horseneck, and it's uh, me, Ian Ross, Jeremy Heeman, who played drums in Roadsaw, and Neil from Mercy Lago. And yeah. So it's a Portland, Boston band. Yes. Well, you know, you were asking about recording costs. Uh, everybody's got a studio in their homes now. 
That's so, true. So you can record. But you were at New Alliance when I saw you, but they're not that expensive. No, you, you do the basics, and then you can send tracks out for people to do vocals and stuff at home. So. Horse neck. Horse neck. Going to look out for that, man. Thanks. Thank you, dude. Thank you, brother. All right. That was good.